The application of the beneficiary principle in the law of trust is a contentious issue which has attracted a broad spectrum of opinions by practitioners and academics alike. Hello everyone, my name is Hazim Ashraf and welcome to the Legal Talks. Alongside me today, we have Amir Harris, Audrey Ng, Wang Wei Shuang, Wang Jiahui, and last but not least, Calvin Chia. Today, we will be discussing the significance of the beneficiary principle in light of the various methods of circumvention and exception to the principle which have developed over time. Before we begin, it is very important for us to get a hold of the basic understanding of what is a trust. There can be no area of law in which there is more confusion about the basic definition than the law of trust. And this is actually because the trust concept arises in a variety of contexts and its ingredient features vary accordingly. Hence, a universal and comprehensive definition appears rather impossible. However, the basic premise of a trust involves the conferring of property by its absolute owner to a trustee to hold for the benefit of a beneficiary or several beneficiaries. In all, there are actually four significant elements to a trust. Firstly, that it is equitable. Secondly, that it provides a beneficiary with rights and property. Thirdly, that it also imposes obligations on the trustee. And fourthly, that those obligations are fiduciary in nature. Trust can take several forms, and among them being a purpose trust. And these are trusts where instead of stipulating a particular beneficiary, they purport to further a particular purpose or objective. And for example, instead of leaving property to be held on trust for my next of kin, I may instead choose to leave it for the purpose of horse racing. And with the exception of charitable purpose trusts, it is a well-settled law that the courts will not readily uphold such a trust because of the beneficiary principle. So, what is the beneficiary principle? The beneficiary principle states that for a trust other than a charitable trust to be valid, there must be at least one identified or identifiable person, natural or legal, who is a beneficiary, and such that they acquire a proprietary right in the trust property. If there is no such beneficiary and the trust is for the achievement of some abstract purpose, then the trust is void. The beneficiary principle was originally articulated by Lord Grant in the case of Morris and Bishop of Durham. And here it was stated that there must be somebody in whose favor the court can decree performance. And this was restated by Judge Harmon in the case of Ree Wood. Accordingly, it has been simply put by Viscan Simmons in the case of Leahy and Attorney General of New South Wales that a purpose simply cannot sue. As illustrated in the case of Re Astor's Settlement Trust, here the courts refused to uphold the trust, citing that there were simply no clearly defined beneficiaries who could enforce its terms. The idea behind this seems to be that otherwise the validity of the trust would depend upon whom of the trustee and a court of the equity does not recognize as valid a trust which it cannot enforce and control. And under the principle, most non-charitable purpose trusts are void. However, as in the case with many equitable concepts, the beneficiary principle may be held inapplicable in certain situations and is also subject to exceptions. To further explore the methods employed for circumvention, here is Amir. Thank you, Ashraf. Firstly, judges have been seen to offer favorable alternative interpretations of the words used by the testator or settler in order to maintain the trust validity. Here it is important to understand that every trust falls to be determined in light of the words used by the testator or settler. It is therefore perfectly possible for a trust which, on its face, appears to be for a purpose to instead be construed otherwise. To illustrate, in Re Osoba, a trust created for the training of my daughter was construed not as a purpose trust, but a trust absolutely for the daughter. Training in this case was not interpreted to be a purpose, but rather a mere super added motive which bore no legal impact. This alternative construction as a trust for individuals as opposed to that for a purpose allows the courts to avoid the trust from being invalidated by the way of the beneficiary principle. Secondly, it is also equally possible to use such alternative interpretations 
to evade a relationship of trust altogether, instead construing it as a gift or a contract. For instance, an agreement in which a treasurer was entrusted with the responsibility of using funds in a particular manner was deemed not to create a trust, but rather a relationship of contractual principal and agent. Similarly, in Rebose, despite being worded as a trust fund, the court elected to instead interpret the testator's words as conferring a gift with the stipulated purpose of planting trees, merely construed as a motive which bore no legal obligation. Hence, it appears that, where possible, courts have exercised a degree of judicial creativity to circumvent the beneficiary principle. Yes, Amir. In fact, the court's tendency to afford favorable construction also extends to circumstances in relation to unincorporated associations. To start off, unincorporated associations are, as their name implies, associations which have not been incorporated under the Companies Act 2016 or its predecessors. These associations, as laid out by L.J. Lawton in Conservative and Unionist Central Office Against Borough, are characterized by two or more persons who are contractually bound together for one or more common purpose, not being business-related. Examples include recreational clubs such as local bands and amateur football teams, which technically do not venture into incorporating themselves as companies. Generally, these unincorporated associations cannot be beneficiaries of a trust. This is because they are not considered legal entities under Section 20 of the Companies Act, provided that they are not registered under any other legislation. To illustrate, suppose that a testator has left property to an unincorporated association, expressed to be for the association's purposes. The association's lack of legal personality means that they cannot legally own the property. Consequently, the alleged trust is then left with no beneficiary. By virtue of the beneficiary purpose, this trust would then be construed as a non-charitable purpose trust and would typically be rendered invalid by the courts. This is seen in the case of Leahy against AG for New South Wales, where trust leaving property for an order of nuns was held to be invalid. This was because the order was an unincorporated association and could therefore not be considered a beneficiary due to the lack of legal personality. Accordingly, the trust failed to be construed as one left for the order's purposes rather than the specific individuals, thereby subjecting it to the beneficiary principle which operated to invalidate it. Nevertheless, the courts have appeared to sidestep the issue by interpreting this as a trust for an unincorporated association as a gift for the benefit of its members, who can be considered ascertainable beneficiaries rather than the association themselves. Cross J, in the case of Neville Estates Limited against Madden, elaborated on this approach by laying out potential methods in which unincorporated associations can be convert property. Firstly, when an association is small and the testator was a former member, a property can be construed as a gift if left to individual members of the association as joint tenants or tenants in common. This has been observed by Sukhninda Padesar as being the easiest method of indirectly entitling unincorporated associations to property. This was adopted in Real Lipsky Will Trust, whereby a man's residuary estate was left for an unincorporated association for the purposes of construction and building maintenance. This estate was construed as a gift to the association members as they were considered ascertainable beneficiaries and who were contractually entitled to enforce said purpose. Secondly, a more contractual approach may also be taken, whereby the gift could be interpreted as an accretion to the club's fund, thereby excluding it from the ambit of the beneficiary principle, but rather leaving it to be administered according to a club's contractual constitution. Hence, the association's members would be bound to utilize the property for the association's purposes by virtue of their contractual relationship with each other. This approach of favorable construction as a gift rather than a trust therefore allows the beneficiary principle to be circumvented, thereby saving a gift and allowing the unincorporated association to benefit, albeit indirectly. Overall, the courts have shown readiness to evade the beneficiary principle by way of offering alternative interpretations of the words used by the settler or testator, thereby rendering it a non-purpose trust, gift or contract instead.
It is through this that the beneficiary principle can be, therefore, effectively circumvented. Thank you very much for that, Audrey. Now, apart from the methods of circumvention as discussed, there are also certain circumstances which have been acknowledged by the courts as being excluded from the beneficiary principle entirely. The case of the Ender Court reaffirmed that trusts created for a purpose are generally invalid. However, Lord Evershed debated this by excluding two general circumstances. Firstly, the various of anomalous exceptions which the law has previously recognized will be discussed by Wang Wei Shuang. And secondly, trust created for a charitable purpose, which will be explored by Wang Jia Hui. Thank you. As mentioned, we will begin by discussing the effect of anomalous exceptions. These are circumstances of unusual character that have been acknowledged by the court as not requiring any particular beneficiary, thereby rendering them exempt from the beneficiary principle. These include the trust created for the erection of grave and monuments, for the care of particular animals, for the private saving of masses, and for the furtherance of fox hunting. This has put by Roxford J. in Astra, which operate as judicial consensus to human weakness or sentiment. In other words, the court have upheld this trust despite their misalignment with the beneficiary principle in recognition and invalidation of very real sentiment of the testator. Nevertheless, a requirement in these circumstances is that the trust remained practically workable. For instance, in Trimmer against standby, money set aside for the purpose of erecting a monument in the testator's memory was held to be valid as it was workable. This was reaffirmed by the Malaysian case of Ri Ku Cheng Tiu. As pointed out by John Chipman Gray, the money could be used in singular expenditure and therefore did not require constant overseeing by a beneficiary. Similarly, in Pettingo, a trust leaving £50 a year for the care of the late testator horse with any surplus being given to the executor was also upheld. Um, the reason being that it was possible for the residual beneficiary to supervise its proper performance. In contrast, Trust falling within the ambit of this anomalous exception, but were nevertheless practical unworkable, for example, being that they were too uncertain, were invalidated. Overall, however, it can be seen that so long as it is practical to do so, the court have displayed willingness to uphold trust falling within this anomalous exception. Thank you, Wishram. In fact, a similar amount of flexibility has also been afforded to charitable purpose trust. These are, as the name implies, trusts created for a purpose which the court considers charitable. No statutory definition can be found in Malaysia as to what constitutes such charitable purpose. However, in the case of Ri Abdul Ghani Abdul Asa, the court adopted the definition formulated by Lord McNaughton in the case of commissioners for the purposes of income tax and PEMSO. This includes trusts created for the purposes of relieving poverty, advancing education, advancing religion, and any other purpose which is beneficial to the community. Hence, the key to determining whether a purpose trust is charitable is to consider whether they possesses an element of public benefit, either to the community as a whole or a sufficient section thereof. As illustrated in the case of AG and Lim Ponyo and others, this affords the court wide discretion in deciding whether a purpose is charitable as mentioned in the case of National anti vivi Section, Society and IRC. The law is well settled that courts will uphold such trust even though its beneficiaries may be unclear. In other words, the court have treated such trust as being exempt from the beneficiary principle. The reason for granting charitable purpose trust, this added flexibility is that, ultimately, they intend to benefit the public. Hence, the court should, where possible, endeavor to allow them to do so. Despite this flexibility, however, there must generally be some level of certainty in the words used by the settler or the testator, so as to render the trust practically workable. This requires, firstly, that the charitable purpose be sufficiently certain. For instance, in the case of Blair and Duncan, the purported trust for such charitable purpose, as my trustee thinks proper, felt by reason of its uncertainty. Here, the court considered the task of determining whether the trust was being performed according to the testator's wishes rather impossible. 
Accordingly, it was held to be void for uncertainty. Apart from that, workability also necessitates that someone can enforce the trust. Malaysia remedies this by enacting Section 9, Subsection 1 of the Government Proceedings Act 1956, which empowers persons with interest to bring a claim subject to the Attorney General's consent. Finally, the trust must be wholly and exclusively for charitable purposes. The court in the case of Nai Seng Pian and Anandas and the trustee of Presbyterian Church in Singapore, Registered and Anandas, emphasized the importance of the trust being exclusively charitable. However, even where a purpose trust is only partly charitable, courts may still uphold it, provided that the charitable purpose is severable from the non-charitable purpose. Overall, it appears that the law has treated charitable purpose trusts kindly, so much so that both legislatures and judiciaries have sought to correct defects created by the absence of clear beneficiaries, either through the enactment of statute or by severance. Thank you for that. It can therefore be seen that the court have treated both anonymous exceptions and charitable purpose trusts rather favorably, exempting them from being invalidated by um, the beneficiary principle so long as they remain practically workable. For the anonymous exception, this is so in order to pay deference to human sentiment. As for charitable purpose trust, it was upheld on the basis of public policy necessitating the benevolent acts such as charity to be encouraged. Yes, in fact, there is one final exception. This is what is known as a Reed Denley Trust. In Reed Denley's trust deed, Justice Goff held that a purpose trust was successfully established on a plot of land for the benefit of the employees of a company. It was here that an exception to the beneficiary principle was created. Dubbed the Reed Denley Trust, this exception provides that a valid non-charitable purpose trust can be created so long as it possesses ascertainable individuals who have locus standi to enforce its performance. In this case, Justice Goff held that such trusts would fall outside the mischief of the beneficiary. The decision in Denby has long been regarded as a contentious one. As explained by Lord Grant in Morrison, Bishop of Durham, it is the presence of a proprietary right that gives the individuals the locus standi to enforce a trust. In Denley, however, it would be difficult to say that any of the employees had such right. As explained by Morris, they merely had an interest not amounting to ownership. Hence, it appears that the decision in Denley runs contrary to the orthodox understanding of the beneficiary principle. Nevertheless, it remains a feature in modern trust law that if a Reed Denley Trust is successfully established, it serves to validate purpose trust, so long as there are sufficiently ascertainable individuals who both benefit from the trust and can enforce it. Thanks, Amir. As discussed, though the beneficiary principle appears to invalidate trust created for a non-charitable purpose, there are abundant exceptions and methods of circumvention. Hence, the question to be answered is whether the beneficiary principle remains a prominent feature of trust law. To do this, however, it may be pertinent to re-examine the definition of the beneficiary principle. As stated earlier on, the orthodox understanding of the beneficiary principle necessitates possessing propriety rights. That is to say, one can only be considered a beneficiary if they possess such rights that will entitle them to avail themselves of the trust under the rule of Sonder. This reflects what Hudson calls the ownership principle, whereby only beneficial owners may be considered beneficiaries under a trust. However, the courts have not been as strict as the orthodox view dictates. In fact, the various exceptions and methods of circumventions discussed prior appear to demonstrate an inclination towards a more flexible approach. That is to say that emphasis is being taken away from the presence or absence of propriety rights. Instead, focus is being drawn to whether, even in the absence of such rights, a trust remains practically workable. This propensity towards workability is particularly apparent when considered re-denly trusts, which operate more like the enforcement principle adopted in some jurisdiction. Under this understanding, though the presence of ownership rights would be ideal, it is not necessarily required 
So as long as there are individuals with sufficient interest to validly enforce the trust, with that in mind, it has been argued that the significance of the beneficiary principle has been sufficiently eroded by case law so as to render the principle no longer a requirement. On this, however, we respectfully disagree. Firstly, it is submitted that beneficiary principle remains significant in preventing the formulation of abstract purpose trusts. This refers to a purpose trust which are so uncertain as to render ascertaining who falls within the ambit of beneficiaries impossible. According to Emma Crowes, the beneficiary principle, even in its present, flexible or purposive state, remains significant in invalidating such trust. This is because, unlike circumstances such as in Denley, abstract purpose trust fail to meet the requirement of workability. For instance, when a testator purports to create a trust to erect some useful memorial in his name, it is impossible to ascertain whether the trustee is exercising his responsibilities correctly as there is no clear and obvious criteria for useful. Hence, the trust does not satisfy the beneficiary principle, even if it is to be construed flexibly. It is here submitted that the beneficiary principle in its present flexible state still occupies the important role of limiting purpose trust to the realm of practical workability. This is in line with the opinion of Justice Goff that purpose trust should only be invalidated if they are overly abstract or impersonal. Conversely, in situations where this is not the case, the court should avail itself to give rise to the wishes of the settler or the testator. The second reason why we believe that the beneficiary remains significant relates to its role in avoiding element of perpetuity in trust. In trust law, there exists a rule whereby a trust cannot operate perpetually. The rationale for this rule is one of policy. As a matter of policy, it cannot be that the property is tied up under a trust indefinitely as this would be economically undesirable, nor can it be trusts that are operating forever for reason of practicality. Hence, the rule against perpetuities was established to avoid such circumstances. Hence, the rule against perpetuity was established to avoid such circumstances. The way that it was to enforce, however, is through the application of beneficiary principle. To illustrate, suppose there is a trust to leave property to any and all family member who become lawyers. This creates a problem whereby an indefinite amount of beneficiary is created as there is no telling how many of one of these next kin would in fact become lawyer. Indeed, it could be that none of at all and not. Indeed, it could be that none at all end up being a lawyer. Hence, in these circumstances, the beneficiary principle operate to enforce the rule against perpetuities by prohibiting such trust. Another circumstances is where a trust seeks to alienate property permanently. For example, suppose a trust seeks to confer upon its beneficiary interest in particular shares, but not to entitle the beneficiary to withdraw the deposited sum. Um, in such cases, the beneficiary interest in the share would indefinitely change hand from the initial beneficiary to his next of kin and ad infinitum. Again, the beneficiary principle operate to prohibit this, thereby avoiding the issue of permanent alienated of property. Instead, to, instead, to comply with beneficiary principle, the court have read a limitation into trust which seek to operate indefinitely operate as somewhat of an expiration date. In Malaysia, the common law perpetuities period has been adopted through Section 3 of the Civil Law Act, which allowed the application of English equitable principle. In, part in particular, a trust can only run for 21 years, or in the case of trust creating life interest, the duration of a human life plus 21 years. Hence, in both examples provided earlier, the trust would still be upheld to an extent. It is merely that they would not operate forever. The beneficiary principles is therefore important to strike a fair balance, avoiding the issue of perpetuities on one hand, while also upholding the wishes of the settler, albeit only to a certain extent. Overall, it is clear that the beneficiary principle, even in its more flexible, redefined state, remains important in remedying the problems of abstract purpose trust and perpetual trust, respectively. It can therefore be said that, even in light of its exceptions and methods of circumvention, the beneficiary principle remains significant. In summary, the beneficiary principle is an equitable principle which the courts have 
continuously sought to avoid through various means. Though this is undoubtedly the case, it would be wrong to say that the principle is insignificant altogether. In fact, and as this discussion has illustrated, it has undergone somewhat of a renaissance into its more flexible, purposive state. This is fitting of its important dual role in not unreasonably invalidating viable trusts on one hand, whilst also avoiding undesirable circumstances such as abstract purpose trusts and perpetuities. It is on this basis of this rule that we believe the beneficiary principle remains a significant feature of the law of trust.